I began this adventure as a routinely trained cardiologist and eventually a molecular biologist interested in the heart cell structure. I never gave a thought as a young investigator to the fact that perhaps beyond reproductive physiology, men and women were different. This all changed for me with a visit the American Heart Association had asked me if I would write a research paper or book on the differences between men and women's hearts. This set me to thinking. If the hearts of men and women were so different, then what about the other organs of the body? So I started out on this great adventure and went to my chairman and I said to him, I would like to examine the possibility that men and women are not identical in every one of their body systems. And he looked at me skeptically and he said, if you can find the resources to do that, go right ahead. And so it went. A judge who had given us the award for this book asked me if I would like to be a consultant to Procter & Gamble who was interested in my telling them what products they could develop for women's health. I immediately said I have a much better idea than just me as an individual consultant. Let's try to form a partnership between the medical school and Columbia University and Procter & Gamble to explore the idea that men and women are different. Probably one of the most exciting features of how the partnership was established between Procter & Gamble and Columbia was Craig Wynett. He was in charge of the development of new products for Procter & Gamble and told me that his interest was in finding new ideas for things that he could develop and sell for women's health. Her very first act of consulting was to tell me that uh, my definition of women's health was outdated, limiting, and potentially dangerous. Mary Ann immediately started to create the idea that what was really needed is not more women's health consulting, but to create new knowledge on the subject of what she was calling uh, gender-specific medicine. We were potentially at an impasse because it didn't appear that in the short term I'd be creating any uh, uh, new products. And on the other hand, uh, it was also clear that while Procter & Gamble and I think every other corporation like ours uh, is is in the business of defining needs first and then products second uh, it was clear that there was a complete lack of knowledge about this entire subject so uh, not just among the consumers but among the doctors as well i remember uh, this is back in 1996 when i asked uh, our internal of people what they thought of all this i started asking them questions like what are the risk factors of heart disease and the very first one listed, as I remember, by our own internal health plan was an answer to the question, are you a man? So uh, it was pretty clear that we uh, had a lot to learn. So we were off immediately to the races. I remember Marianne asked John Pepper and I at one point, what's your vision for how the world might look if we're wildly successful in say 10 or 20 years? And, and both of us said, we saw one day coming to the Columbia or Harvard Medical School campus and seeing the big, uh, tall, brand new women's health building as a sign of, of how successful we've been. And Mary Ann immediately said, uh, what are you guys, a couple of idiots? That's the opposite of what needs to happen. What, what needs to happen is that if you do that, you will uh, paradoxically guarantee that women's health will always be treated as something other than mainstream medicine, literally, uh, maybe big and tall, but off to the side. What you want is that whatever we do is so uh, integrated into the normal practice of medicine that it at some point becomes invisible. The lesson for me, especially for somebody who grew up in the uh, new product business, is the temptation to sound the trumpets and cue up the band uh, when you launch a product to make it uh, exceptional. When in fact, uh, everything Mary Ann was teaching us is that the ultimate success for anything was to make it normal, just part of the way things are done.
As I was preparing for this interview, I did a, a Google search and uh, I typed in gender medicine and what immediately popped up were dozens of articles on gender aspects of COVID. So here we are 30 years later and what is a normal response, nobody had to convince those scientists to do those investigations. It was normal. It's part of what they considered their job is just to now look at uh, the gender aspects of virtually anything, including this deadly virus. Gender medicine is the founder, the innovator behind the creation of a net new discipline to the world is to me one of the uh, most astounding contributions anybody can make. My partnership with Craig Wynette has been one of the most exciting and fun-filled events of my entire scholastic and personal life. After two years of working together, Mr. Pepper and his entourage from Procter & Gamble arrived in Dean Party's office in 1997, and Mr. Pepper said to the Dean, these two years have been very, very interesting for us. We will endow a partnership for women's health between Procter & Gamble and Columbia. And within four days, my good friend and partner, Craig Wynette, arrived with a million dollar check. It has been extremely gratifying to see the foundation grow in influence and power almost three decades later. And we have transformed the partnership now into an independent foundation for the study of gender-specific medicine. We maintain our ties with Dr. Weisfeld at Johns Hopkins, as well as at Columbia, and we are supporting the careers of young scholars who are investigating the differences between men and women. We're now an internationally established science of gender-specific medicine. The subjects that we have uncovered and defined have been refined by many scholars around the world and are now part of medical school curricula in all the countries of Western Europe and in Asia. It's been a fruitful, lively, and completely rewarding partnership, particularly because of the devotion, intelligence, and dedication of Craig.